I'm in the middle right now, finishing a book on the Adinkra symbols uh, for this space I created called Nubia Narrative. Um, and as I'm doing the history of the Ashantis, you know, 200 year empire that kicked the British behind and then got decimated into being colonized. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about all of the rich, amazing empires, communities, cultures that have been decimated by imperialism and, and colonialism, right? Then you get to America as a person uh, of African descent, and then you're confronted with anti-Blackness, not just from white folk, but from Black folk, right? So let's go all the way back to Somalia. You're from Somalia. Tell yes, me something the average person would not know about this great space in Africa. Somalia is in East Africa. Its nickname is Nation of Poets. We value words. We value freedom, absolute freedom. We respect our guests, but if the guest comes in with an attitude or an occupying colonial minds, we are uh, we fight them one hundred percent. Father, uncle, auntie, Somalis, the supreme value that we have is freedom. In the land. When I think when I think of Somalia, you're right next to Ethiopia, which is, you know, that brought us Haley Selassie and the first Christian convert. It is the birthplace of Christianity. It is also, I think, the only African nation that wasn't conquered and colonized. Yes. yes. OK. And you're right next to Ethiopia. What's yes. been that relationship? It, it, the relationship there has been, I mean, Africa is all about a playground for, for, for bigger power. There's a lot of uh, uh, um, wars there. Uh, and the wars are not, really, are not really from the African themselves. It's more of a colonial power uh, uh, pinning against the Africans and because there's a lot of resources there. Uh, but, but Somalia and Ethiopia are right next to each other where neighbors, um, uh, we're Africans living side by side in the African continent. When I also think of Somalia, I think of genocide. I think of poverty, you know, because uh, these are the things that were, were taught. And these are the things that go on in our media. Uh, and you're speaking English, right? So I'm, I, I want to know what your native tongue is and were you raised in school to learn what like i'm i'm always like what are you taught you know here in, in this country we literally took indigenous people people children out of their homes to strip them of their indian native indigenous culture so that they could learn how to be good americans i'm just curious how you know the school system in somalia what what are you taught about yourself and what are you taught about other people uh, the, the, the greatest teacher in that part of the world is Hollywood. And what Hollywood teaches us, I remember when I was a lot, little boy uh, sitting in Mogadishu uh, watching a small magna box, magna box television, uh, things that I saw from America uh, was uh, a depiction that didn't tell the truth, that black people were lazy, black people were thugs, black people were in the corner selling drugs. And that the picture that we have about America is a picture that is not really truth. You only get to know that picture when I myself became that America. I came here and I get to know the people. And I, I, I feel as if I was watching myself when I was a child in Africa, looking into American, American people, mm -hmm. particularly African-American. Now, are these images coming through rap videos that are, Hollywood. you know, like... Hollywood, Which, Hollywood, right. movies, Boys in the Hood. You know what, y'all? The depiction that is exported of Black people is so destructive that I don't know why we don't have a, a whole, like a whole, you know, like arm of, our, you know, of the NAACP out fighting these images because they literally are destroying our relationships with other people in the world because of how we're depicted. We should have zero tolerance, which is why I'm so vigilant in fighting against the N-word and all this, these, this, these other things. But tell me something, Boya J. Farrar is here. His book is called, America Made Me a Black Man. So now let's delve in. What year did you come here? 
And when I did came this here. Happen? I came here in 1993 in the height of the Somali Civil War. And um, I went to a small suburban town, 99.9% .9 white uh, outside of Boston called Bedford, where the grass is green and completely trimmed. And, you know, so I was running away from the war. I've been seeing refugee camp, I've seen war. And then, you know, I, I wanted to get to America, heaven. You know, I was, I, was, look, I was chasing home, chasing peace, chasing American dream. And I got dropped right here, uh, right outside of Boston, a place called Bedford. And, and what did you learn? School. Okay, so you, you come here, your English is English taught in the Somali school system? No, uh, Somalis have a language uh, called Somali language. Um, Somalis are very anti-colonial. The resistance is very strong. My, my father was a fighter. His father was a fighter. His father was a fighter. The day I was born, I was destined to be a fighter. Fi fighter. I'm the first son in my family. And when my father, the legacy of my father is nothing but words and words that says, never allow another man to look down on you. You're equal. If you're not equal, you're the star, you're the sun. Nobody's above you. But then you come to America and it's a completely different story. Completely, the struggle is real. The pain is real. The perpetual pain is in incredibly real. And so what do you do when your own father tells you you're completely, you're this person, and then you come here, you really are not. Um, you know, so really I learned in, when I was young, we, 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 schools taught Somali language uh, throughout the school system. Farrar, um, Mr. Farrar, Boya Farrar is here. Tell, tell, can you say nobody is above you in Somali language? One more time. means nobody's above you. Oh my goodness. I'm going to get this. <laughs> Come on, say it one more time. Ofkala Kamasareya. Kamasorea. Off cut. Off Kamasorea. You're doing great. Off cut. Okay. I'm going I'm to keep practicing it because I think exactly. those mantras, you, you're, you're people of language, you're people of poetry, those, those, those words spoken in that native tongue, I think there's power. There's some spiritual power to that. Off color, Sama Korea. Off color, Kamasorea. Yes. It's, it's, a, it's a very, okay. very powerful because at the end of the day, um, I've, I've witnessed war. I've seen dead people. I've seen uh, uh, refugee camps. I've seen everything in life. But if the words that which you carry inside of you are not broken, then you cannot be broken. You know, so America tried uh, its best to break me. But if, if, if you're broken, then your identity is broken, then you as a person is ultimately broken, a man with no identity. I think what protected me is nothing but words inherited from my departed father's words. That's the only thing he gave me, words. Um, and he died in 1989. Wow, Afkala Samakorea. Afkala, indeed. All right. Boya J. Farrar just gave me some, some words in my mouth that were unfamiliar and then became familiar in less than three minutes. And I appreciate that. We are talking about America made me a black man. To be made into something that is foreign to you, is this a negative experience that America made you a black man or, or is this empowering? Was this empowering? Um, it's, it's complicated. Uh, America from coming in, of course, you're fed it. You, you, get, you say, if you get to America, you really are gonna be all set. You know, as long as you get education and you're, you can do whatever you want or you can chase the American dream. But you get here, you get a, I get educated, I got a master's degree, got a few other certificates, but then I get to see almost everyone that looks like me is struck, educated, but struggling. Uh, you know, and the, the pain that it belongs to me belongs to all the black people around me. 99% uh, mm -hmm. of the people are struggling the same thing I'm struggling. So the freedom that I carry from my father and the freedom that I carry with me and the freedom that I associated with America it's not here. Uh, and instead, there's perpetual struggle here. So the, the idea that oh, I'm Black, I'm proud to be Black, I'm, I'm an uh, African-born American, um, I carry the same culture uh, African-Americans carry because poetry 
rap is nothing but poetry. Um, when Tupac does his poetry over the beats, I'm attracted to that. When, when Prodigy did that, I'm attracted to that. When the Wu-Tang, from, from, I'm from that generation. There's connection there. So ultimately, the more I stayed here, the, 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 the more I realized that they, they are really a spokesperson for me. They're telling their story from their hood. I'm telling my story from my, my place, but my father's struggle is Malcolm's struggle. There's connection right there. My real auntie, my father's youngest daughter, youngest sister rather, was abducted by the British army. And before he died, my father told me that in his deathbed that he's, he's dying, but if I ever have a chance to look for his sister. Mm. So they, they, even though there's two different places, the struggle is the same. African continent they struggle the same thing. African Americans struggle in this country. Uh, so that connection has to be made. And, you know, mm. I wanted to tell the story so bad. And I'm glad you're, you're um, it's, in the, it's in the hands of the world today. Yes, America made me a black man. I often, I've been spending a lot of time on the continent in my spirit. And I look at this, this map that, you know, many of us in school, they have a map and they have Africa about the same size as, as uh, South America. <laughs> and it's actually five times larger, like yeah. South America, India, uh, United States of America, Russia, all of that can fit inside of the landmass of Africa. And I often ask this question, how in the hell did these little tiny countries, Portugal first, Spain, France, Great Britain, how were they able to come into this amazing space that gave us everyone from Mansa Musa to Shaka Zulu, you know, the, the, the nations of Kemet and, of course, uh, Nubia and, of course, Egypt, which to this day unrivaled right gave the world everything there's no greek anything without egypt there's no jesus actually who spent his childhood in that space yes. learning from yes. the master scholars without there's no christianity without the continent of africa so you think about or judaism or uh islam without africa so you think about this space how were they able to dominate and i asked this question of everyone from howard french to dr gray carr all the historians in my life and it's because those people on that landmass didn't see themselves as one people. They were different tribes, different kingdoms, different, different, different. And at the same time, these Europeans who were different, different, different fighting with everyone, the Vikings and everything, fighting, found something called whiteness to galvanize them against this darkness, this black, this beautiful power of blackness. They created whiteness and they were able to conquer because these folk didn't see themselves yes. as one. I feel like that's the center, center of your book. Partly, uh, think about it. My, my mother, I, partly I grew up in the valley with my grandmother as a good herder. Um, and they're probably the happiest time in my life thinking about it. And my mother did the same. My mother now lives in Somalia. And what she tells me is, well, when I told her that I'm, gonna, I'm writing this book, she said, don't say anything negative about America. Say everything positive, love, 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 love. And the reason being is, she said, when we were in a refugee camp, America was only the only country that allowed us to enter the country. You know, so she's got a point, but she doesn't realize that I'm an, I'm an American, I'm an assimilated American. And you do not know America until you simulate it, until you get a job. That's when America tells you who she is. Uh, but another thing I ask is, when my mother, when we were growing up in the US, we used to be addicted to the Discovery Channel. And Discovery Channel tells you, they, they go to the darkest places in Africa and they tell the story of people who are far away from the cities, isolated in the corners, who are naked or half naked, chasing the monkeys. And they take that picture and they tell you who you are. So I asked my own mother, have you seen this before? And she, I've never seen a, a lion. I've never seen all these dead, you know, uh, half naked people. So where do they, where do they get it? It's, it's nothing but a projection of imagery that the Africans living in America are told that if you go to Africa, you're gonna see nothing but half naked people running after monkeys. But that's, 
that is not the, that's not the case. America is as beautiful. Africa is as beautiful as as America. Partly, you know, a lot of parts of America, Africa is gorgeous. So sometimes when I was in Africa, the images that were said to me about the African American is the same as not the images true. that is yeah. fed. It's not true, but it's right. similar to the images that are fed to the African Americans about Africa. Both depiction are far from the truth. And, and look I what was pieces of that. Listen, um, as you're as you're laying this out in your book, which I think is so amazing. Uh, and y'all got to get a copy of it today. I'm not going to give away. I want y'all to discover America made me a black man. I want you to discover the story of Boya J. Farah. As we're talking about this, the trick of dividing a people because of because you can conquer when you divide, Sun Tzu told us, right? That's the yeah. best to, to divide a people that yes. gave you civilization and humanity. And, 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 and do it to the point where you in Somalia, most of us here in America see each other as so distorted, not as our full, not even as cousins, which we are, by the way, as family, which we are, by the way, is so it's, you know, I have to give a chef's kiss to the, to the uh, architect of that because it for 400, 500 years, very effective. But I feel like there's an awakening happening and you Boya are going to, you know, definitely one more piece in this awakening where folk are starting to see the truth and see one another, see each other in each other, that we are one. I think as 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 hard as it is, part of the, the I think the the amazing thing that's happening now is that the one thing that they did do was make you a black man. That was that's going to be the undoing. Because I'm saying like whiteness is a made up construct. So you're black. Yeah, I'm black because y'all made up this thing called white. There's no such thing. But Uh, there's power in this thing now, this blackness, because it is literally the galvan is so huge. The largest demographic of people, Nigeria, young people under the age of 18. Next to that, Ghana like population explodes while Europe is diminishing, Japan is diminishing, yeah. China's yes. diminishing, everyone's diminishing, except in yeah. that first, the birthplace of humanity. Africa. Are you optimistic? Because I know you are, but tell me, tell me what, what brings you optimism, Boya. Um, you know, a, a writer is always, um, I carry love for humanity, despite everything I've seen in life. And as you said it, you know, uh, I'm optimistic because a plethora of communication now. They are, uh, uh, communi- I mean, media is not, it's not isolated to four or five white owned uh, publication. Media is now diversified as, you know, there's, everyone can tell the story of everyone else. And that is, there's hope that finally uh, history is not written by, history is written by the passage of time. It's time that people tell the truth the way truth is, that black people are not really a minority. Uh, and Africa is absolutely a gorgeous continent. I just came back from there. And so there's a lot of hope in that. And I want an African child born in America, because that's what black people are, I believe, should know that Africa belongs to each one of them, that Africa is a continent on the rise. Um, that humanity is going to get better despite everything I've seen. There, even though I had to tell America, I had to, I, I wrote this book so America can look itself in the mirror and examine its own destruction, the, uh, its own savagery against uh, black bodies in America. But at the same time, I want an African child to know that he's loved, that continent is beautiful that they got to take a trip. Uh, as soon as they came back here, I went to Chipotle. Chipotle. And first thing, <laughs> Chipotle. I, mean, I missed that, you know? So okay. I went there and I was like, I saw an African child and I, you know, African-American kid working there. And I was like, hi, how you doing, brother? And the first thing I told him, hey, what are you doing? And I'm a writer. I just came back from Africa. Now Af- you need Africa, you know? And, you know, and he, he promised me that he's going to go there. And I was like, don't worry about anything. Just go there. You know, look for a ticket online. It's $500. Just go to Ghana. 
and hang out for a, a, a week. So you can understand there is a, you can channel uh, this negativity. Uh, yes. and know that there are the people that you belong to that are not going to treat you the way you're treated right here in America. So th- there's a lot of hope in, in I, I carry a lot of hope. And that's probably the reason why we're talking now. I'm hopeful. I love it. Hope is in the air. Um- we're talking with Boya J. Farrar. He's the author of Ma- America Made Me a Black Man. America Made Me a Black Man is the first book length examination of American racism through the eyes and lens of somebody not American. And I, I love this. Um, you know, we've had Kaffa Boy, which examines, you know, uh, South Africa and apartheid through the lens of Mark Mathabane, who is a South African, but you get to, you know, peek into the window as you're talking uh the jewish faith the the community they have these um trips back to israel but every jewish american or british they sponsor trips you know to israel for folk and they have rites of passages of course built into their culture we need that we need that where did you go when you when you traveled recently boya where, where what country did you go to I went to Kenya, I went to Ethiopia, and I went to Somalia. I actually stayed in a village in Somalia. I actually fetched my own water. I wanted to be completely at peace uh, because after 30 years of perpetual pain, going from one job to the next, getting stopped by the cops, getting abused of things that I could Okay, pause, 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 doing. pause. You just like, all right, all right, because I'm like, you just right. throwing these out. I know it's in the book. Right. Uh, Sorry, Sorry. No, 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 no. Um, and I'm a, we're gonna come back to your experience going back, but I, I would be remiss if we didn't like kind of first time stop by the cops just because you're black. Do you remember it? Yes, I do. What happened? Um, we basically it was multiple times. Um, uh, <laughs> one time it was, it was, it was, I can't even remember so many of them. I expected it, and every time I see a cop, one time it was me and my brother sitting in the car. No, we were actually driving. We saw a car going in the one, the opposite way. And we were like, you see that cop? I told him, you see that cop? He's going to turn around and stop us. He actually made a U-turn and stopped us. And yeah, we had nothing. We make, you know, the, we didn't have it. He, he tried to look for things that, that he can accuse us, but couldn't find anything, so he let us go. Mm. And how did that make you feel? Uh, if it makes you... At the time, I was I was young and I was you know highly optimistic. Oh, this is nothing, you know. America's beautiful. But the the more you the more that happens, the more it chips away your 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 soul. It gets to you finding yes finding a job like being successful. You know, because a lot of people come here because the projected image is you come to America's the land of milk and honey. You're going to be super successful. Did that happen for you? No. That is that that. I feel as if there are, uh, there's two America, America for the black, America for others. That is not true. Um, and from my, because I'm using my life as a subject to tell the story from my own experience and how much love and gratitude, how much I wanted to work hard and I did everything the way it should be done. But I had to give pieces of me. I had to give parts of my spirit to be successful. I have to compromise the soul within. And anyone who doesn't want to do that, you're going to be drifting from one job to the next. That is the reality mm. of America. I couldn't do that. I and, couldn't. I couldn't compromise. And your recent trip gave you what? As we wrap up, the recent trip that you just took gave you what? Um, it 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 um it it restore parts of what's broken. Spirit wise, um, uh, my soul needed it. My spirit and my whole uh, this chipped away humanity came back in pieces 